Well, amen. Amen. Good morning this morning. Grab your Bibles, if you would, please, and let's open up to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. We want to study this morning Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Very important and pertinent uh, uh, study for us this morning. Remember now that we're going through the book of Matthew. It is a study of uh, the kingdom of God. That's... Uh, Matthew's emphasis, the, the gospel of Matthew has the emphasis of the kingdom, that is that the king, the Lord Jesus, has arrived and he has introduced to us now uh, the kingdom of God. This morning uh, we're coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You'll remember that that started way back at chapter 5, runs all the way through the end of chapter 7. So we have just a couple more weeks in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the study of the Sermon on the Mount, the subject of the Sermon on the Mount, is how to live in the kingdom. And so we know that Jesus has come and he's been preaching repentance and belief. He's been uh, calling on people to repent of their sins and turn and trust in him. And so there have been a number of people who have professed that faith in him. And so now he begins to teach them how to live in the kingdom and that's what this whole sermon from chapter 5 to chapter 7 is all about he uh, as he finishes these uh, kingdom principles he's hitting on some very key issues and much of it has to do with salvation much of it has to do with how we enter the kingdom and uh, whether or not we've been um, duped in that and that's really today's subject uh, it's the oldest trick in the book. The oldest trick in the book. Apparently, uh, that uh, phrase has been around for several hundred years. Um, it, what it means is that there's a trick that somebody falls for, and uh, they continue to fall for. So it becomes the oldest trick in the book. I can't believe I fell for that. Apparently, there's an Egyptian hieroglyph that uh, is 4,000 years old, roughly, and it portrays somebody doing that magic trick with the uh, three cups and the one ball underneath, you know, where you do the moving it around. So that trick uh, has been claimed as the oldest trick in the book. However, when it comes to things that really affect our lives, when it comes to something that is uh, hurtful or painful, uh, we don't want to fall for those tricks again. Something might be funny if we see it over and over again, but uh, as the saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Because we don't like to be tricked, right? We don't like to be duped. We don't like to be fooled. The latest, I don't know if it's the latest, but one of the big things right now is phone scams. Uh, so many people have fallen for phone scams. We know an elderly lady um, right at 90 years old who was taken for about $12,000 uh, about uh, roughly about a month ago. Um, the people repeatedly called and she kept falling for what they were saying and so she continued to put out uh, two, $3,000 increments of money until it accumulated to $12,000. We know of several people in our church that have uh, fallen into the trap of some of these phone schemes. And so, you know, nothing makes us feel more foolish than being duped, right? We don't want to be duped. Somebody comes along and, and uh, tricks us. It's, it's, it's painful when it's personally costly. Yet uh, there is a, a scam that has been pulled successfully on religious people for thousands of years. Uh, long before the hieroglyph on the wall in Egypt, there uh, was a trick that was pulled on those who claim faith in God. And uh, it's been used over and over again successfully through the years. And uh, the truth is we're still falling for it. In fact, I would say that uh, it's more likely today that people are falling for it than ever before. It has become something that people refuse to uh, be educated about. And so Jesus is really attempting here to educate people in the kingdom about this, about this scheme. So if you look at uh, Matthew 7 and verse 15, uh, notice what it is that <coughs> Jesus is, is saying. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. When I was uh, in the trucking industry, which was my career previous to this, I worked uh, for Ford Motor Company first and then Freightliner Corporation next, but uh, when I was working for Ford Motor Company, there was a man who frequently visited uh, the dealership that I was running at the time, and uh, his name was Vern Jones. I don't think it's a problem to mention him by name. I don't think we should have a problem mentioning the names of these people. But he was a self-proclaimed prophet and teacher, and uh, I didn't know much. I was not a believer, uh, had no idea really what the Bible said, although I'd grown up in church. It was one of those churches that has a few uh, scriptures and then a nice lesson. But uh, he, uh, he caught my attention. They had church seven nights a week, and that was one of the first things that caught my attention is how committed this man was. It was incredible. Uh, at one point, he was talking to me, and I didn't really know why he was so interested in me, but he'd stopped into my office to talk again and And uh, I went to his church that night. I was pulled into it, and I went there that night, and I was that close to being baptized in what he called the Holy Spirit. Uh, He claimed that if I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'd no longer sin. And to be honest with you, this morning, that's probably why I wasn't baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was still pretty interested in sinning. Uh, But I was pulled in by that, and it seemed to all make sense to me, and his words were good. But what really struck me was the end of our relationship. The end of our relationship happened like this. Uh, Vern stopped by my office one day, and he said, well, I'm not going to be in the repair business anymore. He said, "Uh, I'm moving to Raleigh, North Carolina. He said, I'm going to start a church up in Raleigh, North Carolina. But he said, what I'd like you to pray about is, could you give me $200? Well, back then, $200 was a lot of money. And uh, so I didn't think twice about it. I thought, this is a committed man, and I'm going to do gooder now, so I'm going to give him 200 bucks. So I did. What's interesting about it is I never heard a word from him again. Never saw him again. Never had any contact with him again. And there was something about that that hit me as very wrong at the time. Even with the the little that I knew, I knew it was wrong to just take money and be done. At this stage of my life, experience and study, there's no part of the Vern Jones story that surprises me. Um... It doesn't surprise me that I foolishly bought into it. Uh, It's the oldest trick in the book. It is the oldest trick in the book. What began at the dawn of mankind has not subsided. Rather, I think it's increased. I think we can all agree to that. And it's increased substantially. In the first century, the vast Roman Empire had built a highway system in order to move their military machine quickly to any place in the empire. They also insisted on a common Greek language, the Koine Greek, common Greek. What they didn't know was that that highway system and common language in God's sovereignty would be the way that the gospel would also spread throughout the known world. It spread at an explosive rate because of that highway system. But evil always follows close on the heels of the truth. Always. You can watch that happen. Um, It is always quick to present fine-sounding alternatives to the truth. As sure as a shadow follows the actual person, counterfeits follow the Word of God. So it will be in the kingdom of God, says Jesus, 
And what he teaches us here in our text today, I think, is incredibly helpful to this culture where the Roman system of highways has been replaced with an internet system of highways that's uh, much larger and much faster and, and certainly crosses all the borders of language. In addition to that, the internet system promises riches to the most entertaining liars. So false prophets <laughs> now have a, a new media that they didn't have before. They're coming out of the woodwork to happily trick anyone who will buy into or listen to what they say. So we have this passage. We want to exegete it properly. We want the Bible to interpret the Bible. So we want to take this in thirds. What Jesus has said here is uh, easily broken down, I think, into thirds. And uh, we want to clearly understand, we want to be equipped to deal with the oldest trick in the book. Uh, I would caution you before we step into this that what uh, evil would like to do this morning is to have you believe that you don't need to be equipped against false teaching. That would be the best trick in the book. And so I, I really want to plead with you before we start that you hear what Jesus has to say here. He thought it was important, and it really is. So, as I said in thirds, first of all, I'd like you to notice the warning I'd like you to notice the warning. The warning simply shows up at verse 15 where Jesus says, Beware of false prophets. False prophets. False. Fake. Not the genuine article. Prophets are teachers, preachers, those who claim to speak for God. That's what the word actually means one who speaks for another. In this case, they claim to speak for who? For God. This is our New Testament. If you've been with us from the beginning of Matthew, you'll notice this is our New Testament introduction to a problem or a challenge, a danger that's as old as mankind. The oldest trick in the book. And what I mean by that is this book. You go all the way back to Genesis to Creation and, and one of the very first things that happens is the evil one shows up not looking like he normally looks. Apparently his appearance was pleasing and he had some good words and what he did was he twisted God's word to benefit himself. It's the oldest trick in the book. It didn't stop there. The evil one's purpose was to create more and more of these people who would do this, to create followers of his. Ephesians 2 tells us that there are many who are sons of disobedience. Well, in the Old Testament, Isaiah refers to them as teachers of lies. So you have... The Old Testament filled with these false prophets. And now we're informed in the new age, in this present age, the church age, that they will infect the church, Jesus says. They will infect the church. Now, the previous text, uh, as we study this, it's always important, isn't it, to look around at what we've already studied because why does Jesus place this text about false prophets where he does? How is it attached to what he's already said? Well, notice in the previous text, he has been teaching us about the narrow way. How do you enter the kingdom of God, right? The narrow way. It's through the gate. It's Jesus is the way into the kingdom of God. And so he's been talking to us about these two gates that lead to two destinations. One is life and one is destruction. And he immediately then follows that with beware of false prophets. Oh, wow, look at this. 
Clearly, false prophets are a grave danger to those who listen and follow. Look, it's no minor error that they're giving, right? It's no small bad teaching that they're sharing. That's not it at all. What they're teaching is that you can enter through the wide and easy gate and you'll be fine. That's what a false prophet teaches, and it leads to that fatal error. It's no small, minor error. These false prophets don't know the way to heaven. They don't know the way to Christ. They don't know the way to God. They themselves are not going that way, so they take their followers with them, with them the direction they're going. And where is that? Destruction. Jesus taught about this over and over again. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, Can a blind man lead a blind man? Won't they both fall in the ditch? But here's the other side of that. I love this. Paul is talking to young pastor Timothy. And Timothy's a good fellow, but he's young, and he needs to know how to handle uh, the Word of God. And so Paul says to him, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save yourself and your hearers. So in any case, watch that now, in any case, the teacher is taking those who listen the direction they're going. You see that? That's, that's how it works. The truth sets us free, and the false enslaves. And that confusion, you and I both know this, don't we, that that confusion has caused many people to just throw out the whole system. I don't want anything to do with church anymore. A lady wrote to a pastor I know a few years ago saying, it, quote, it is because of preachers like you that I don't go to church anymore with so many different ideas. Who can know what's right? No thanks, she said. May I tell you that's the wrong conclusion? See, it's God that has set up this system whereby uh, the church is taught and matured by pastors and teachers. I, I can't tell you after 30 years of doing this how often I feel funny about doing it. What I mean by that is why am I the one doing this? This is ridiculous that I would be up here doing Do you know who I've been? <laughs> But what brings me to the right conclusion every time is Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 says, he, And he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, that's pastors, teachers, to equip the saints for work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, that we all attain unity to faith and mature manhood in Christ, he goes on to say. He gave. Do you see that at the beginning? He gave. Who gave? Jesus gave. So it is Christ who in ages past gave apostles and prophets who were carried along by the Holy Spirit and penned God's word and so that in this present age then he could also give pastor teachers who would take that then precious word of God and handle it rightly, divide it rightly, and equip and build up and mature the saints, the church. So we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, amen? Rather, God is sovereign in everything, and watch this closely. Whether a teacher is faithful or a teacher is false, God uses it as a sort of Sorting mechanism. Sorting. Good fish, bad fish. They, go, they run in schools. His command is not that we quit on the church or quit on pastors in general. Rather, his command is beware of the false ones. Amen? Beware. That word beware, uh, it suggests devotion of thought or effort to a thing. Devotion of thought or effort to a thing. That's what beware means there in the Greek. 
which, by the way, some people will not do. Are you aware of that? They're not going to give a second thought to something like this. I'm not going to start worrying about who's a right teacher and who's not. In spite of the warning, there's a whole lot of religious people that are not devoted to this at all and, and instead are going to be deceived. Turn over with me to 2 Corinthians 11. You want to be able to go back to, to Matthew 7, but turn over to uh, 2 Corinthians 11 for a moment. Let me just uh, get your feet wet with uh, the fact that some people just don't care. They're really religious, but they don't give a rip. They just follow whatever. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 there. Paul says uh, to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, but I'm afraid that, watch this now, that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims, watch now, someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed. That's a different Jesus than the apostles, than the word of God says. If someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit, small s, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's some other kind of spirit working in this church from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So notice what's going on there. Paul is chastising the church at Corinth for falling into the oldest trick in the book, and the reason that they're falling into it is their lack of devotion to identifying false teachers. See it? See, the person who blows right by all the warnings of Scripture and refuses to be devoted to recognizing false teachers ends up receiving what they really wanted anyway. Did you know that? They end up receiving what they really wanted anyway. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, listen to this, listen carefully. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, somebody say I'm listening. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That's what they wanted. They wanted to suit their own passions. They wanted to suit their own uh, flesh. <laughs> now, on the other hand, those who are really in the kingdom of God, those who are truly in the kingdom of God, back at Matthew 7, those who are truly in the kingdom of God will heed and trust Jesus' warning to beware of false prophets we're going to believe they exist we're going to watch for them and we understand that this sorts people out and i want to be on the right team so this is the warning beware of false prophets that's the warning now i want you to notice the deception the deception Jesus says that false uh, teachers, preachers, or prophets are not easily spotted. That's the deception. In fact, false prophets, watch, they all have one thing in common. One thing in common. They, what does he say? They come to you in sheep's clothing. That's what they all have in common. They all, he says, come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, let me explain what it means to come to you in sheep's clothing because the Bible interprets the Bible. I don't. Uh, in John 10, you'll remember from last week's study probably that Jesus identifies the church or the kingdom of God as the sheep fold. Right? The sheep fold. So we're, we are the sheep of his pasture. Jesus is what? Jesus is the good shepherd. That leads a sheep, John 10, verse 14. And we also know from our study so far in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus has been identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's also a sheep. 
right? So false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, that means a few things. Let's, let's take a look at what that means in depth. First of all, it means that they are deceivers. They are deceivers. False prophets who come to you in sheep's co- clothing are doing that on purpose. Who come to you? That's an interesting phrase. <laughs> Maybe there is some indication of clothing here. Um, here's why I say this. At Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said that the Pharisees had this impressively looking clothing that made them appear very religious. So clothing might be somewhat in mind, but I want you to understand that the primary meaning here is an internal issue of salvation. These people are deceivers. They're what? They're liars. Are you with me? Somebody say liars. They're sons of the devil. They're intentionally appearing as a believer in Jesus Christ. They're intentionally appearing as a sheep. Or worse, they're intentionally appearing as Christ himself. Or they're appearing as someone who has a way to God that nobody's thought of so far. A new way into the sheepfold, John 10 says, over the wall instead of through the gate. So you have this idea uh, in the, in, way back early in the first century, we have the warning of Jesus that this is what's going to happen, and then all along the way as it has happened, while Joseph Smith comes up with his golden tablets that show you how to get into the sheepfold, or Mohammed comes up with his five pillars of Islam, or Joel Osteen comes up with his prosperity gospel and makes that main line, Whatever it is, all the way along, millions of people buy into it, even though Jesus said, beware, beware. So first of all, they are deceivers, but secondly, notice that they will come from within the church. (laughs) They will come from within the church. Now, uh, let me be clear about this. The church, by definition, is saved people, right? But Jesus said there would be wheat and weeds in it among us. And so uh, you have false converts that sit among real converts. And some of those false converts become false prophets, Sheep's clothing indicates the appearance of a sheep, we said that, but they're going to have many of these external qualities or attributes of sheep. They come from within the church. John, in 1 John chapter 2, he, he wrote to warn his churches about false teachers who would come along, and he said, they went out from us. They went out from us. So they can in no way be called one of us, but their origin is the church. See it? Now I have no doubt that probably, I can't do this scripturally, but experience-wise I can, they probably saw somebody on stage that was popular and had a church full of people and they said, I bet I could do that. And their, their heart, for the wrong reason, said, that's what I want. But sheep's clothing also means that they appear to be doing good. They appear to be doing good. Back at our text of John 7, verse 15, Our text says, uh, false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Do you see that? Inwardly. Somebody say inwardly. Inwardly they are ravenous wolves. That word inwardly is uh, inner being. It's the same word that's used for the inner being of a person. The soul. This is who they are in their innermost being. Ravenous wolves are, are hungry. 
They're starving, and deception is their meal ticket. Peter says such persons do not serve the Lord Christ but their own appetites. So Jesus continually promises that the elect will not be deceived, and that's largely because we're going to be the ones who are unpopularly devoted to identifying false prophets. But I want you to understand, they have to get their followers somewhere, don't they? Right? They have to get their followers from somewhere. So they prey upon a particular uh, group of people that's mentioned throughout Scripture. Let me give you a few descriptions from Scripture of those who are pulled in by false teachers. Number one, those who are weak-willed. Weak-willed. Second, uh, those who are barely escaping. You remember at Matthew 13, Jesus teaches the parable of the sower, and uh, the word of God is spread, right? But the very first person, by example, in that parable is the person who receives the word of God, but the evil one comes along and, and snatches it away quickly. So, so here's the person who's barely escaping, starting to hear the truth, and the evil one grabs it away. Another description is the naive. Romans 16, Paul talks about those who fall for flattery. They love that sort of thing. Don't we all? Be careful. <laughs> And then there are those who desire the law instead of grace. In other words, they want religion instead of relationship. And lastly, there are those who are easily tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Now, what do all of those people that are mentioned throughout Scripture, what do they all have in common? They all talk about the same kind of person there, don't they? All of them speak about the person who just doesn't know God's word. Maybe doesn't care about God's word. Maybe the person is more interested in some kind of experience than God's word. But it all points to that person who doesn't know God's word. They easily get pulled in by false teachers. They don't know what they're looking for. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 11. You would please, Second Corinthians eleven. Look there at Second Corinthians eleven. Look at uh, verse thirteen, if you would. Second Corinthians eleven and verse thirteen. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen. Watch this, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan does what? Disguises himself as an angel of light. It's no surprise if his servants also do what? Disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Disguise, disguise, disguise. Three times. The emphasis is that false prophets are not identified by some kind of external characteristic. You're not going to know they're a ravenous wolf by the way they look. Amen teeth aren't going to be showing, they're probably not going to be growling, and they're most certainly not going to come to you and say, hey, by the way, I'm here to consume you for my own gain. They're not going to do that. You will not identify them by appearances. They look like sheep. That's the deception. You see it? That's the deception. So, number one, we have the warning. Number two, we have the deception. Part three, what do we have? We have the provision. Whoops. We have the provision. For those uh, in the kingdom of God, God has provided a means to recognize false prophets. Verse 16, if you're uh, back at Matthew 7, you'll see this at verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. People of the kingdom will recognize false prophets. This is a very forceful statement. You will. 
recognize them. Recognize is a very important Greek word in this sentence. Uh, it means to recognize a thing to be what it really is. Did you get that? Recognize means to recognize a thing for what it really is. You will recognize them. Jesus speaking to those in the kingdom. Here's what you'll need to be on the lookout for. Are you ready? First of all, you're going to need to be on the lookout for the produce. Be on the lookout for the produce. This is God's provision for believers. You will recognize them. How? By their fruits. Fruit is what a person produces. Elsewhere, Jesus says that it's not what goes into a person's mouth that makes them clean or unclean. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes them clean or unclean. In other words, uh, it is by what a person produces that you'll recognize them for what they really are. Turn over to uh, Galatians 5 with me. Some of you knew we were going there, didn't you? Galatians chapter 5. By the way, good for you if you knew that. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, notice here that um, at Galatians 5... Um, if you're looking at uh, about verse 16 there, notice that this is all introduced to us as the two root systems or sources of what comes out of a person. So why does a person produce what they produce? Because there's a root source within them. Are you with me? There's a root source, what they produce, two root sources. One is flesh. The other is spirit. So now when we come to verse 19, we understand that the root sources are producing these kinds of fruits. So look there at uh, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, that's one root source, right? The works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, uh, sen sensuality, uh, idolatry, sorcery, which by the way is the Greek word pharmakia, drugs, uh, Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits or of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, um, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Just in case you missed anything, and things like these. <laughs> I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now verse 22, here's the other source, but the fruit of the what? Spirit, capital S, right? The fruit of the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So it is by what a person produces that you will recognize them for what they really are. So in verse 7, or excuse me, chapter 7 of Matthew again, chapter 7 of Matthew again, Jesus says preachers, teachers are like trees in that they produce fruit according to the type of person that they are. They produce fruit according to the source of what is produced. You will recognize them by their fruits. See that? So look, now think with me. We are in the business of seeing the invisible. Right? You cannot tell whether someone is saved or not by looking at them. When the Spirit enters, uh, I was uh, so surprised to find out I looked exactly like I did before. And wolves in sheep's clothing are more common than sheep in sheep's clothing. Well, where did he get that? Well, the way is hard and few find it. When it comes to pastors, preachers, and teachers, we must be in the business of seeing the invisible. I, this is a, a call to you to, to wake up and start paying attention. 
Pastor teachers will be judged with greater strictness, James says. And so what we need to understand is that this is beyond the fruit of the Spirit. So the fruit of the Spirit covers everybody, doesn't it? The fruit of the Spirit is, is how we know uh, that a believer is a believer in general. But what about pastors, teachers? James says they'll be judged more strictly. How do we do that? Well, 1 Timothy 3, I, I believe, is how we do that. Turn there if you like. I'll spend a moment there. It's a, it's a whole sermon in itself. 1 Timothy 3, toward the back of your Bible. I uh, want to remind you that um, Paul is writing to Timothy, and Timothy is a young pastor, and so now we're talking about the qualifications for a pastor in 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. Notice what he says first, the saying is trustworthy if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. Now stop there for a moment. You'll say, well, that doesn't say pastor, doesn't say poemine, doesn't say uh, the Greek word for teacher. But what you need to understand is that uh, in 1 Peter 5, we have three terms all interchangeable. Uh, one is pastor, one is overseer, and, and uh, the other is shepherd. So... These are interchangeable terms, so when he says, um, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he's talking about pastors, are you with me? He says there, he desires a noble task, therefore an overseer must be above reproach. This just went to a new level, didn't it? Right? Must be above reproach. The husband of one wife. What did you just see there? One qualification is what? It needs to be a male. A pastor is a male, not a female. Can't be. Not according to God's word. I mean, you can go places and find one, but the qualifications in Scripture is that this is a male. Now, there's all kinds of things that are female exclusive in God's word as well. This one is male exclusive. Going on from there, you might find the, the, the normal fruits of the Spirit, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, but then there's able to teach. See that? So you could stop right there. There's plenty of other qualifications that I really encourage you to look through and study. But notice there that teachers will be judged with greater strictness on Judgment Day, and so we need, watch, we are the sheep of His pasture, and he has called us to be growing in our discernment so that we're training for that day when we are also judges there in heaven. We'll be judging the angels. We'll be judging. That's what you're in training for. So you must certainly, most certainly, carefully judge teachers here and now. So be on the lookout for produce. Be on the lookout for produce because one thing is certain, a Christian will produce these fruits. A pastor must produce these. See it? Secondly, be on the lookout for certainty, the certainty. What I mean by that is, and I'll show you this in the text, what I mean by that is don't say, well, you know, maybe, I don't know, no big deal to me. Don't be weak on this. Be devoted to this. Anybody home? Be devoted. Back at Matthew chapter 7, look there at uh, verse 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Well, why is he so certain? You will recognize them by their fruits. He's so certain because of what he says next. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now think about this, a, a grapevine will always produce grapes. Thorn bushes will always produce thorns. Fig trees consistently produce figs. And thistle plants will always produce thistles. By the way, thistles is the same Greek word as the Septuagint uses in Genesis 3.18 when God curses the ground and says it's only going to bring up thistles now. A cursed thing brings forth thistles. Go practice that in front of your mirror. 
You don't get grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. The point is you will be able to tell what kind of plant it is by what it produces, and you'll certainly be able to tell what kind of teacher he is by what he produces. It's going to be flesh or spirit. It's going to be from one list or the other. It's going to be good or it's going to be bad. Amen. So be on the lookout with certainty. And then thirdly, be on the lookout for the consistency. The consistency. The reason that we can be so certain is because of the consistency of the fruit. So looking again at Matthew 7, if you look at verse 17 now, moving forward, verse 17, Jesus says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So what we're looking for in a teacher is consistency. See that? Healthy, think with me now, healthy refers to that which is produced by the Spirit. Healthy refers to that which is produced by the Spirit. Diseased refers to that which is produced by the flesh. Diseased is produced by the flesh. Our flesh is totally depraved. It's fallen. It's corrupt. It's it's cursed. It's diseased. It's what the Bible teaches us. So the only thing that makes us good or healthy is the indwelling of God's Spirit. You see that? That's why Jesus says elsewhere, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. It comes out of the source. Now in verse 17, you've got to circle the word every, don't you? Every? Somebody say every. So every healthy tree bears good fruit. Yikes. <laughs> when a person is saved, that, uh, that is when God's Spirit moves in and begins to produce good fruit in that person. A, a person, things change. Things change. The fruit of the Spirit with consistency. Now, uh, verse 18 there says a healthy tree cannot. Just to put another level on this, you see that at verse 18? A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. How is that possible? How can that be? Well, God guarantees the consistency by his working. It's not by our working. He guarantees the consistency by his working. Uh, Philippians 2, for example, says it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God that does it. Amen? It's God that does it. Now, maybe a good tree occasionally bears fruit, uh, bad fruit. Maybe a uh, a good tree occasionally bears bad fruit. I, there's no maybe about it. So what does God do? His working in the situation guarantees that it will become consistent. Turn over to John 15 for just a moment. Look at what he says. God does this, not a person. There's nothing we could do to make this happen, but God does guarantee it. John 15 Verse 2, he says, uh, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. So if a tree is not doing so well, but it is one that does produce good fruit, because the Spirit's in him, what's going to happen? God's going to do a little work on that tree, isn't he? And he's not going to let up. You say, well, I don't understand what that means, prune. I don't get it. Does God get out the shears? Well, kind of. Uh, Hebrews 12 says the Lord disciplines those he loves. He disciplines, uh, and discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There it is, right? That's the pruning that God does in the life of somebody who's actually saved, who, who has God's Spirit in them, God's going to bring about the consistency in that person's life. Good fruit. And so a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. The idea is what sort of fruit is produced by that teacher uh, year after year after year? Let's look at the long term. 
Let's see what happens. You are determining the kind of tree by the type of fruit. It's a long-term thing. A healthy, Holy Spirit-indwelled teacher is not capable of bearing fleshly bad fruit on a consistent basis. Nor will a diseased, fleshly teacher consistently bear fruit that appears to be fruit of the Spirit consistently. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, evangelicals got a little bit excited. I saw some articles about it because Joyce Meyer, female preacher Joyce Meyer, preached the true and accurate gospel at one of her events. And so everybody got a little wound up about that. Oh boy, look what's happening now. She might have changed. A couple of years ago, Benny Hinn publicly admitted that he probably had put too much emphasis on the prosperity gospel. People got excited. Now that's all very good, and we hope that there will be true repentance and that there will be uh, a false prophet that comes to true faith in Christ. But here's the question. What did they do next? Not what did they do in that moment, but what did they do next, and what did they do consistently? When the Pharisees showed up at John's baptism, and it, and it looked like they were really going to change their ways, John didn't say, let's have a party, the Pharisees are saved. That's not what he did. Instead, he said, Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's what he said. What we're looking for is long-term consistency. If you had a, uh, an apple tree and there was no other source of food for your family, and it occasionally bore good fruit, but the rest of the time it grew poison apples, <laughs> you'd find another source for food, wouldn't you? Verse 18, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. The idea is what sort of fruit do they bear year after year? And I would call your attention to a verse at the end of Hebrews. Let me read this for you. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Somebody say, I'm listening. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you in the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. This is long-term stuff. This is long-term. So don't be confused by the consistency of a false prophet's follower. By the way, do you know that uh, false prophets will have many followers? Are you aware of that? Do you, do you get your head around the fact that they have their followers and they'll have lots of them? The Bible indicates that most people will follow false prophets, not the good shepherd. So when you go back to 1 Kings 18, for example, you've got Elijah one man against 450 false prophets. That's a picture for you right there. And, uh, and in the New Testament, you have one Paul and many Judaizers. So you always got this lopsided thing, don't you, where very few people are finding the truth. I was trying to help a, a Catholic come to uh, understand the truth of God's word. Um, just a few weeks ago, I was in a meeting doing this uh, with, with he and his coach, and... Uh, one of the statements that was made to me is, don't you understand we have 800 worshipers on Sunday morning? I must be wrong because there's so many of them. And then his next statement is, what do you have? Well, I think I have some people that are getting saved. <laughs> That's what I think. Most will follow false prophets and not the good shepherd. And the reason is that most refuse to do exactly what Jesus says here at Matthew 7, beware of false prophets. Most are refusing to do that. Is anybody hearing me this morning? They refuse to give thought, they refuse to give devotion, they refuse to give effort to recognizing teachers for what they really are. They want what that false teacher offers and they're willing to give their lives for it. It's interesting to me Benny Hinn and Paula White had an affair that was widely publicized, and they didn't even deny it. And both of them are still making millions of dollars off of their ministries today. That was several years ago. I mean, that, that according to 1 Timothy 3, excludes you from ministry. Joel Osteen writes books with titles that are anti-biblical titles. I mean, they are absolutely against the word of God just in the title. You don't have to open the book. 
and yet he sells millions. What if a teacher consistently bears bad fruit, like some we've been talking about? <laughs> well, not only should you sort them out, but guess who else does? God does. Be on the lookout for the promise. That's the, the fourth thing there that I would call your attention to. Be on the lookout for the promise. It doesn't end well for the false prophet. Verse 19, we're back at uh, Matthew 7, verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If overall the tree does not consistently bear good fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. The fire throughout God's Word is, is hell. But what does it mean to be cut down? John the Baptist was preaching to the false prophets of his day. And he said, uh, even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Cut down means death and judgment. <coughs> Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for a man to die once and then face what? Judgment. <laughs> God has determined that men will die. By the way, that's, there's no mistake. It's no, God didn't slip and, and people started dying. God has determined it's appointed for man to die. God has determined that men die. When the curse of sin fell, death became the great equalizer of men. Everyone dies. Everybody faces judgment. A false teacher may accumulate a great following, great riches, possessions, whatever. But the promise is they will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So it's a very temporary victory, isn't it? Jesus concludes with verse 20. Here's the last verse of our study. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. The word thus doesn't occur in the Greek. He just repeats the same sentence as he did earlier. You will recognize them by their fruits. So what's he saying? The last thing he's saying is don't follow them. Don't follow them. They're headed to the fire. Don't follow them. Now, I want to encourage you just quickly, and I'm in overtime again, but I want to encourage you quickly to, to do just a couple things. Number one, uh, uh, I would encourage you to beware of false prophets for yourself. In other words, uh, thin out your listening and reading list. S start waking up to the fact that there are false prophets and Jesus said there would be. Um, Second thing, uh, so, so that means grow up in this, amen? Secondly, I would encourage you to beware of false prophets for other people. Now, you can't force people or change people that don't want to be changed, but be willing to help others escape the fire, um, the fire they're heading for. Remember back at verse 12, chapter 7 and verse 12, what, what did Jesus say? So whatever you wish others would do for you, do for them, right? Um, if a person... Isn't it, I get this question a lot as we finish up. Uh, do you think there's any saved people in this particular denomination or, you know, this, this apostate certain denomination? Or do you think there is, Lynn? Well, here's what I know. What I know is that if a person actually somehow miraculously by the hand of God gets saved in a false church, that they'll come out of that false church. That's what I know. They'll leave. If a person is in a church where false teaching is the norm day in and day out, sitting under a false teacher, and God somehow miraculously saves that person, Jude calls that being snatched from the fire. God says, go out from their midst, separate from them, says the Lord. That's God's word, 2 Corinthians 6. It's no different than God saying to ancient Israel, don't, don't live amongst these people who don't believe what you believe. Don't do that. You'll get pulled in. Don't be unequally yoked. Do you see how many times God's word says it? Come out from it, right? Come out from it. So look at the, uh, your outline again. Number one, we've been warned. Number two, the deception has been exposed. Number three, the means of recognizing them has been provided for. So notice the kindness of God in this. 
You do not have to be deceived. You don't have to be one of them, do you? And you are, you're equipped to help others. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to study your word this morning. I'm grateful, God, that your word is just uh, really um, so powerful and amazing, so, um, so down to the root of things. Father God, uh, I pray this morning, uh, there, according to your word, there are those who are operating in the spirit, there are those who are operating in the flesh, there are those who have not come to saving faith. And so, uh, Father, the, the operation, the way we do things is still in the flesh, but now, God, we know that your word saves, that when you implant your word, that it does save the soul. So, Father, I pray that there are those here today who are turning from sin, turning from the oblivious way of living that just kind of follows whatever, turning to Christ. And not just any Christ, but the Christ of the Bible. Father, help us to be a people who are not so willing to put up with false teaching. Make us aware. Help us to listen to what you say in your word. Help us to take action, action, and not just passively sit under this stuff. God, uh, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.